Hey, what up? It's Julio with Small Camera Big Picture. I'm talking to Tracy Miglowski, who, if you don't know, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna like read the list. Uh, Olympus visionary, mom of three, wife, professional photographer on the Olympus Global Pro team, pro photo legend of light, which is amazing, and uh, Miller speaker team and writer and. I'm, I'm, we're going to get to it at some point, but I'm going to have to ask you when, when you sleep, because <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like going over all this stuff. I'm like, damn, I have like two things I do. And I'm like, like to the wall. So anyways, welcome Tracy. I'm, I'm super, super amped to, to chat with you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So I, I've been wanting to talk with you for a while. I know we, we, we met at one of the trade shows some time ago, but it, you know, it's like, when you're at the trade show, it's kind of like, Hey, how's it going? See you later. And it's like, you know, exactly. super quick. And you know, it's a lot of fun and everyone's burned out by the last day, but now, now we're here. So thank you for, for coming. Yes. So you've been, I mean, you got so much work, you know, when I was kind of doing, kind of digging in, I'm like, where do we start? But why don't we just, can you just kind of tell me how you kind of discovered photography and when that when after you discovered it, you kind of started to fall in love with it and realize that this is your thing? Yeah. So I think the first time I really realized that I enjoyed photography um, and started taking pictures and thinking like, whoa, this is really cool, was when I had kids. And I think anyone who has a baby um, really quickly realizes how much you want to take pictures and remember every little thing because it changes so quickly. And so when my oldest son was born um, 19 years ago, um, I started taking pictures, but I had a point and shoot film camera and um, I would dress him up and do funny things. I had like all these little costumes that I like to use and um, he hated it. He still hates getting his picture taken because I tortured him so much. (laughs) But um, I think I learned a lot about what I liked about photography, even though I was kind of just playing around. And then fast forward a few years later, I was still taking pictures. um, But I started having friends say, Hey, could you take pictures of my kid? And so I started doing it, I wasn't getting paid anything, I was just doing it because I liked it. And I think the realization really dawned on me one day when I got a phone call from a photo lab saying, Can you um, give a photo release for these images so we can print them? And I was like, first of all, what's that? (laughs) And secondly, like, oh my gosh, like someone thinks these are good. And I don't think I ever really took myself seriously um, till then. And then I started to really play with um, light because I started out natural light like everyone does. And um, I was terrified of any kind of off camera flash or any kind of deals like that. So I was I was definitely like, oh, there's a window. Let's stand by that because that was the easiest thing. Um, And I love to tell the story that my very first ever reflector, I was taking pictures of of this set of twin boys that were like under a year old. So they were like laying under this tree and the shadows were really deep because it was the middle of the day. And I was like, I need to get some light to those babies. So all I had, they were at my house, was a mirror. So I brought out the mirror and I was reflecting the light back with the mirror, which obviously was like, not the way to do it. And, um, but I learned so much and I started off like everyone else, like with no knowledge and a whole bunch of enthusiasm and it paid off over the years. Um, now my passions have changed so much and I think they'll continue to do that. Um, I think it's what allows progression is the acceptance that things will change. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, a very big nutshell, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I love that you are open to change. That's something you don't hear with photographers. In fact, it's obvious, it's often the opposite, right? Well, when I first yes. started shooting in 2005, I was one of the bringers of change. I had, um, just got an Olympus E1, their first DSLR yeah. and I go, yeah, and I was shooting my covers with that. Um, that mm-hmm. was the camera that I used to pull me, help me pull out of poverty, which was rad. So I go to like an ASMP meeting and people are just super upset and like, you know, fighting change. And I was like, this is really weird, but here you are, you know, embracing mm-hmm. embrace. So you've seen, you've seen a lot of change in your time. Like what was like, 
one or two things that that you saw that were like, wow, this is this is a change. I want to go in in that direction. What was? Can you give me some examples? Um, the first big change was definitely mirrorless because um, I was an Olympus DSLR shooter, and I had all the things, and I loved my gear. This was prior to being a visionary. Um, and then Olympus made the announcement to mirrorless and like everyone else, I was like, wait, what? I had to buy all new crap. And I wasn't that happy about that. Um, until I tried the camera and then it became very obvious to me when I rented the camera from, um, borrow lenses. And, um, at the time it was the E M five, right. was the first one. And I was at a wedding and I pointed that little camera at a, a half drank glass of wine sitting on a table. And I was like, it's so tiny. And I took the first picture and my reaction was like, oh my God. Um, the focus, how fast it was comparatively, just like everything, it just shifted something inside me. And I was like, okay, this is the wave of the future. And, um, you know, I think coming into portraiture and just um, whatever, I chose a boutique brand. Not everyone was using Olympus at that time. And so I chose a boutique brand. Um, and I like to call it boutique because to me that's what it was. It was something I was familiar with because that was the film cameras I had. And I just was, I was enamored with Olympus. And I'm, I've been a fangirl ever since. Um, so I'd say mirrorless was the first one that really like, man, that kind of blew my mind and, really started this now look everything's mirrorless um well everything awesome is mirrorless and um <laughs> and so and so that was the first thing and then another trend that i think i saw in photography was the shift where everyone became a photographer that i think was mind-blowing when when was and, that about what, like what what year do you do you remember that more or less oh my gosh it's been several years um i would say like eight years ago, um, really when cell phones became like everyone, you know, was carrying them and they all had good quality cameras or at least some kind of quality of a camera, people became aware that they could do it. And I think more and more, um, with the rise of the internet and, you know, social media, people are becoming more aware that they have the ability to create things. And so I think what it did for me, which is different than maybe what it did for some, because some people are like, they're ruining the industry. Like, you know, these people that are entering the, and, um, and I don't think I ever looked at it that way. I think I looked at it as a challenge to separate myself. Like, what can I create that is mind blowing, that is otherworldly, that is magical, that is different. And I never wanted to be like everybody else. And I still don't want to be like everyone else. I have a different weird vision and I, it changes all the time. I don't think it'll ever be the same. Um, and I actually, I like that and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stop doing that. So that's, that's a wonderful story. And, and, uh, it speaks to me like, I'm like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, so I see your work and I'm inspired by it. It's, it's got like elements of fantasy and fashion and, 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 uh, you know, a little bit of like photojournalist and journalistic mi mixed in there and some shots. How, how would you describe your work? You know, um, because it, my vision is always changing and my passions are always changing. It's difficult to nail it down, but I do know one thing that I think is pretty consistent in my work. One thing I adore creating and capturing is some movement. I really love movement and it could be wind in the hair or the toss of a gown or uh, anything. I just really love the movement. I think I would view my work as somewhat ethereal and a lot of um, fantasy driven um, even in my work with maternity and um, family photography, I love to add an element of fantasy. And so um, sometimes that works out really well. And sometimes I really have to work hard to get it. Um, but I still think that every moment can be honored with a little bit of the fantastical. Do you, do you think, because you work mainly, correct me if I'm wrong, you work mainly with 
just regular people that want cool photos for themselves or their family. Is that right? And then and, for the most part, right. uh, my personal say, my personal work is, is some models. Okay. Um, I've begun to spill over a little bit. It's interesting because now uh, I know that more people are taking pictures, but more people need pictures now than ever before. So on a grander scale, if we're all really smart and we want business, we'll know that every single person that you see in the world needs a photograph because pictures are everything now. That's how we communicate. So um, we're not even communicating with words anymore. People barely pick up a book or read a sign. It's the image says everything. So, um, so the reality is that I've kind of morphed my business to fit that need too. So now I'm working with people who are models and influencers because they need imagery just as much as the next guy and theirs has to stand out. So I've begun kind of going into that realm as well. That's cool. So are, are, are you finding that like, we'll talk about the influencers in a moment, but as far as like the, the families that are hiring you, are, are you finding that they're wanting something a little um, more fantasy than like your regular, Hey, let's all go stand by the lake. And we're all going to wear the same shirt and the same jeans kind of thing that we used to had, had seen for years. Yeah. So I think with family photography, as I mentioned, I think it's a little bit more challenging because you do have, um, you know, maybe a small child and a mom, but I still think that there's this desire for things to be magical looking. So yes, I think people still come to me for that. They still want it to be, have that ethereal feel, my kind of style and whatever in it. And with maternity, that's definitely the case. I feel like People come to me for maternity because they want to feel and look like a goddess. And um, and I feel like that's what I try to give to them because that's how I see them. So, yeah, I mean, it's like a goddess is how I would describe your maternity photos. They're very powerful. Um, very cool. So, I mean, OK, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about this stuff myself because I, uh, I have not photographed just regular people for the most part in, in that realm. Um, so I'm always mm -hmm. curious about that. So you're finding that people kind of want something that, that takes them out of their, their everyday life to kind of encapsulate that into a photograph, like more than just the maternity, right? The, the regular, the individual people and then the families that kind of want something a little more magical, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Like I think, you know, it's like my vision for my work when I meet someone who wants to work with me, my vision for that experience for them and for myself is to ignite something in them that creates this vision of themselves, either what they experience now in themselves that they haven't let yet, yet seen or acknowledged, um, or to ignite some desire towards some um, image of themselves to create an even better self than they are now. And so a lot of times, um, it might be giving someone like one thing I noticed with, like, if I work with a dancer, they don't know how they look when they're dancing because they're doing the dancing. And so if I can show them how beautiful or elegant or free they look when they're doing that thing, it's a totally different view on the world than what they have of themselves. So then they see themselves in this different light and it ignites this passion that maybe even wasn't yet there and makes them an even better dancer because now they see what they look like when they're doing it. It's the same with, with and you'll relate to this because you have a child. When a couple comes in and they've just had a baby, one of my favorite things in the world because there's this brand new love, this brand new experience and it's all so foreign to everyone in the room. Mom, first baby, doesn't know how to change the diaper. Dad is scared the baby's going to get dropped or he's not going to do something right, right? Um, baby is brand new to the world. And this love has never been seen by them before. And what an honor to be in the room and be able to show them what that love actually looks like with them in the picture. So I think at the end of the day, that's what people really want. They're like, what do you see when you see me doing the me that I wish I was or that I 
think I am or that's inside of me that I haven't seen yet. So I think to answer your question, yeah, I just, that's what I want is to give people a vision of themselves that they haven't seen. Yeah. Yeah. I totally get that. Cause like when, when I'm hanging out with Roman, I'm so like hyper-focused on him. Um, everything else kind of melts away, including, uh, photography, unless I'm photographing him, then it's all like this weird, amazing energy, but I have no idea what I look like, you know, when I'm doing that, but I feel it. So I, I totally yeah. get that. So how, how are you, how are you kind of getting to getting them to open up since these are not professional talent? I mean, is it, is it like when they first reach out to you or do you I mean, do you have like a, a moment where you sit them down? Like, all right, let's kind of get to know each other. How, what does, what does that look like? So this is a, another thing in the industry. And a lot of times um, I get a little confused about how people explain things. And I think it's because I come at things from a different angle all the time, which always throws people off a bit. But like the consultation bit that everyone talks about, you should have a consultation before you do a portrait session of any kind is really true for me, but it isn't so that I can sell people stuff. Um, it's actually so that I can get their trust. Um the most important piece in in this whole thing of photography for me is I do this because I want to connect with people. Like, if it was just a pretty image, it would be great. But the connections and building that trust and and then having someone open up to me is just, oh, that's the magic. That's what I love so much. So getting that consultation and sitting down with people and just having a conversation about what they truly want. And I think like a lot of times people are like, I just want a picture that I, so I can remember, you know, this stage or whatever. And it's like, okay, but then you get to the bottom of it and you realize they really want to see what their family looks like. And, um, and make no mistake, these moments are like so fleeting and you know this cause Roman's probably huge now. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you still remember when he was like just born and you're like, how did it happen? Um, and everyone's living that same life and more than ever, the world is moving so fast. And so sitting people down and saying, Hey, let's talk about what you really want these images to feel like, um, that's man, that gets me going. And then I sit down with them. We have the consultation. We talk about what we're making and how we're going to make it. And also what elements do we need to make it happen? Do we need someone to come in for styling? Do we need a hair and makeup artist? Do I need any props that I don't have? So I'm ready. And then um, by the time they get in front of me, we already have a trusting relationship. And I'm not a stranger. And I think that's another big part of it. Um, you know, I think for me personally, I don't know about you, but I hate getting my picture taken. And actually, I even don't like being on camera like this. Like, I'm not super comfortable with these kinds of experiences. But I also recognize that in order for people to be comfortable doing that in front of me, I have to get really comfortable doing that too. Um, so when people come in front of the camera, I'm super sensitive to the fact that they probably aren't that comfortable getting their picture taken. Because I'd say every class I teach, I ask the question because photographers forget that people don't like getting their picture taken. So I'm like, hey, how many people here love getting their picture taken? And without fail, there's always one weirdo that raises their hand like me. And I'm like, okay, you're one out of everyone else. Everyone else hates it. Um, so another way to answer your question is too, I love shooting with live view. And one of the reasons why I like it is because I don't have my camera up to my face covering me and keeping me from connecting eye to eye with my subjects. So um, any amount of connecting that I can do, I'm all down for it. Another thing that like even the gear we choose, it's like if you're always having to check things and move and go and change this light and do this, that or the other thing and you can't do it from a stationary position, you drop the connection and then you come back to it and you're rebuilding again. So I'm always trying to create an atmosphere where we can stay connected the whole time. Yeah, I to totally. I mean, it's like it's like a dance. It's like that rhythm, and especially yes. once you're once you're in that that the height of that rhythm, you don't want to stop because oh, I got to go over there and adjust that light, or you know, you don't know, right. you know, you're figuring out your gear, or it's not reliable, or something like that. So you're using uh, the EM 
one cameras, right? Your the Olympus yes. that, that's like your main bread and butter camera, and then you're using your lighting as as pro photos, obviously, because you're with pro photo. Now, now I'll need you to kind of explain all the gist of it, but basically you're, it's all TTL and it's controlled all from the camera. You don't have to like go control this light, that light. Y'all just do it here or in front of you. Right. Yes. So how, yes. how, how else, so how is all this basically impacting you to create uh, more uh, compelling images and what you where you were, you know, prior to mirrorless and all this insane technology? So um, the main thing is, uh, and you you may be able to appreciate this because I think that we kind of come like at this in, in similar ways, and maybe even from similar directions. But when I I told you at the beginning of this conversation that I started out with natural light, well, um, the next thing from natural light was obviously adding reflectors, which was my my first one was a mirror, and then I I grew up and got an actual reflector. <laughs> And then um, as time went on, I realized that even that wasn't enough, that I needed some artificial light that I could bring um, to, to create my own light and get more control. And so then I started shooting with flashes. And I had little teeny, you know, flashes that I would take with me. And then I realized that one flash wasn't enough and I needed two. And then two wasn't enough and I needed three. And then pretty no, you know, you're, you're carrying around all these flashes. You've got two on a stand and you're trying to do all this stuff. Um, and flashes aren't that reliable, um, because of the recycle time and everything else. So when I discovered pro photo, I will never forget the shift that I felt inside me that I knew my work could be free now. And same with mirrorless. It's like your gear should be complementing your creativity. You should be now having to think less about the gear and think more about how free you are to create. How are you getting into your, your, your best creative mind to create something meaningful? And so how that works with me, with the gear that I'm using is that I know I'm going to rely on the flash to go off every single time when I'm using any of the pro photo gear. I know that the color is consistent, so it's not a nightmare afterwards. That's a huge part for me. Um, and I can control everything from right here on my camera. Um, the TTL bit is so great because now I can literally get my subject in place, meter for my background, and then I just put my my pro photo gear in TTL, take a skin exposure shot by just getting only the skin in the shot. I get a perfect exposure on the skin. I lock it down to manual. I no longer have to think about whether or not it's going to be correct. I know the exposure on the skin is perfect. And since I'm not trying to expose the sky and the trees and everything else with my light, I'm all good to go. Um, it just means that then I've set it up and now I'm free to create. Um, it's the same with like, it's same with everything, with even with posing. It's like I try to explain to people, if you're at a wedding and you're doing some posing stuff for a wedding, go in with a plan. Because then you can get through your planned stuff. You can do the, the stuff that you know you have to have then your brain is like able to go to the creative stuff that you haven't done before because you have time. Um, so I think the biggest thing that technology has done for me is it's made me able to free my mind for the creativity that I really want to have um, by just getting out of my way. And everyone thinks it's about the camera or the lights, and it really isn't. It's just about them th those things getting out of the way so that you can actually be creative. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, to me, it makes 100% sense. I think that unfortunately, the majority of people getting into photography may get lost. Uh, that may be lost in them because maybe they're focused on having the biggest 100 megapixel or whatever. Um, which I was kind of find kind of funny because at the end of the day it goes on Instagram, but you know, that's another episode, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, right. Exactly. Uh, you know, what I mean, like I see people and I'm like. And like, all right, they're they're rocking it out, and they're like, dude, I'm just changing my name to Zeus because I'm a god. And then it gets shared on Instagram, and someone's like, that you take that with your iPhone? And they're like, oh god, why? You know, but um, yes, exactly. but yeah, I feel the same way, right? It's like the 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 tools, the the paintbrush should just basically just kind of melt away and allow you to 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 focus on you. You're basically explaining what I call intention, right? You're going in with a plan. My intention is to make this, and then what tool what applications and tools whatever fit that and then those need to to not 
you need to not be messing with those on on your shoot. Now you you teach this though. You teach a variety of what you basically told me in in workshops, right? For Pro Photo and Millers and Olympus, obviously. Um, can you kind of give me a rundown? Do you have like certain classes you teach where people can kind of learn from you with about this stuff? I do. So I teach, um, I do teach posing classes and I think posing is one of my favorite things to teach because I do think that it is one of the most powerful tools of photography that nobody talks about. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I say that because, um, I spend all of my time photographing, well, I mostly photograph women. Um, and I always say this and it's true. You can have a picture of a family and the kid can have his finger up his nose and dad can be, you know, eyes closed. And if mom looks great, she's like, I want to buy that one. Right. Because it's all about how she looks in the image. And um, and to be honest, the women are buying the photography for me, right? So, like, the men kind of show up like, do we have to do family pictures or do we have to do these maternity pictures or what's an engagement shoot? You know, they're really not as into it. But women um, really do want to look good in the photographs. So I think like the most underused tool in photography is like posing people properly. Um, so posing classes are something I really enjoy teaching. I do teach maternity classes as well um, with a heavy lean on the, the posing aspect of that. Um, same with anything to do with senior portraits. Um, and I'm one of those rare photographers who still thinks that there's a value in not just doing one type of photography and keeping myself totally exclusive to only maternity or only this or only that, because I do find that I can stay more diverse in my abilities when I let myself practice all different types of photography. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with just photographing people. Um, so I do that. Um, I also teach lighting classes. Um, I love teaching the lighting classes because there's all these no pun intended, light bulbs going off for people during those classes. And also because light used to scare the, the crap out of me. I used to be so terrified. It's like somebody would pull up a flash and I'd be like, oh, my God, I don't know what it's going to do. Like, you know, and I always felt like it had a mind of its own. Um, it's been the journey of such joy to figure out that I can make the light do what I want it to do. Um, and so I love helping people with that. Um, and then, um, I think that's, that's about what I teach and I do business classes as well, which is really fun. Um, that's another one where a lot of light bulbs go off because I think a lot of people struggle with the business side, um, because it is separate of creativity a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, I would say that I would, I struggle with the business all the time. I am 44 years old. I've been doing it for a minute, but it's never a day goes by where I'm not, I'm not like challenged by something. I'm like, Oh, I never thought about this scenario and now it's here and you gotta, you gotta right. be, be quick uh, and figure it out. Speaking of which uh, you were talking about earlier about how you, you know, you're working with you know families and whatnot, but you're also now starting to work with influencers. How, how is that part of your business different from working with, uh, with, you know, a couple and their kids? So it's different in the objective and it's also different in a little bit of the control. Because, um, as you know, like most influencing is done socially. So people have a certain aesthetic that they're going for and it kind of takes the style bit out a little bit. And I have to be willing to, to, to let go a little more than I'm used to letting go. Um, and that's a good exercise for me cause I'm kind of a control freak. I think most photographers are. Um, but then the, the end game is, um, for it to impact a larger audience where the exact opposite for my families, I want other people to love the images, but obviously my objective is for the images to impact that family and for them to love them and connect with them. So I think that's the big difference um, between those two genres. But at the end of the day, it's still the same. It's this, this creative rush of, um, of just making something not necessarily different for the sake of being different, but different because it's how I see it. So with what I'm hearing is with families, you're, you, you're able to um, have them go along with, with your vision. Cause right. That's kind of what they're hiring you for. Whereas with influencers, they kind of have their own vision of how they should look. And then you're kind of collaborating 
uh, in, in that regard. Is that, is that right? Yeah. And, um, and a lot of the challenge is just like, you know, uh, figuring out all the pieces and then bringing it together and saying, okay, here's what we're going for at the end of the day. And this is what we want it to look like. This is the color wash or, you know, messaging because the messaging is super important. And in order for them to stay consistent and on brand with themselves, the messaging has to remain consistent throughout the images as well. So there's a lot of thought that's going into the underlying messaging. And to me, as a creator, that's really important because I'm into the story of something. Like, what does it mean? And so um, if I can get that really crystal clear before we even start shooting, I'm like good to go. But I just need to have that messaging before we go in. Got it. So is the so the retail customer, the families are buying prints, prints mainly, correct? And right. And then the influencers are doing what? Are they getting like a library of images of them in different poses with different outfits or where, where, where's the, the dividing line with the purchase? So the, 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 yes, the, that's a really great question. So the influencer purchases all for social media and web. Right. Well, all, all one and the same. It all, yeah, just all social. Okay. Okay. And, um, and that's like an interesting thing for me because as a portrait photographer, the industry has largely moved toward print and IPS, and I'm all on board with that. Um, but on the influencer side, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, it's all for the gram, right? Exactly. So are they are they like all like, hey Tracy, we want this to look light and airy? Are they all they all like want light and airy? There's some of that. There's some of that. Okay. That's really that's my biggest struggle, honestly. Everyone wants light I'm and airy. Not- I'm like, I want it to be correct, you know? And so then you have to like really step back and say, okay, you're creating this for someone else, not for you, you know? Um, So I have to just balance it. I have to know that my creation, um, the things I do for my own personal self get to be different than what I'm creating um, in these other genres. And and I do have to create for myself because I'll go crazy if I don't. Now, when you say create for yourself, is that a separate, your own separate, like test shoots for yourself? Or is that like also within the realm of the the assignment? Sometimes it can be in the realm of the assignment if it's not too far off. Um, But sometimes I just have to like, I'll, I'll often have, there was, there have been several shoots recently that I've finally gotten to realize that I, um, they're living in my head for like a couple years, driving me crazy. I'm sure you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'll have this vision in my head. And um, for one shoot recently that I'm thinking of, I I had the pieces kind of kind of vibrate into my life over a couple of years. And I finally got to do the shoot. And it was like it blew my mind because it was exactly what it looked like in my mind. But it was like all those pieces had to kind of come together over time. And um, I have a lot of things like that in my head that I've got to get out at some point because if not, they'll just drive me nuts. Got it. And so how often do you schedule time for yourself to, to shoot your own stuff? Um, once every two weeks is about the minimum, the minimum that I can go without needing to do something okay. for myself. Um, but if I can do more than that, then I will. It just depends. Again, it's bringing all those components together um, so that it's meaningful. Yeah, well, you you stay pretty busy, right? I mean, you have three kids, three well, three teenagers, right? Plus mm-hmm. your husband, and I think he helps you with your mm-hmm. biz, with the business, right? He does, yeah. And and then he, you, yeah. So you then you do, and then of course, obviously, being a visionary, and then you're teaching and you're shooting, you're doing stuff like this. Um, without like you know going crazy, how, how do you balance all this so that you're, you know, so that you wake up in the morning, you don't feel like you're about to pull your hair out. I, I did that a long time ago, so. Yeah, I see that. Right. Um, you know, I I want to like I always want to answer this question and give credit where credit's due. One of the most amazing speeches I ever heard was by Shonda Rhimes, and she was I think speaking at Dartmouth con- commencement, um, and someone asked her about the balance question. She was explaining that her answer was that you don't like whenever I'm away traveling to teach. 
um, my family is here and it's out of balance and there's no way that it cannot be. Um, the laundry's piling up, you know, the groceries are being eaten and not replaced. Things are happening. And I think that it's an important thing to remember that it's okay if things aren't always in balance, as long as when you come back to them, you try to strike the balance again. And um, I think there's this misconception in our society too, that you have to have all this balance and you have to have self-care and you have to have all, and it's just more pressure to be honest at the end of the day, come on, let's be, let's be frank. When we travel, we don't eat well, not as well as we should. So when you come home, you try to get back on track and get back on your exercise track and do your thing. But the reality is that if, if it was always in balance, then that would be off balance too. And so I think it's just accepting that things will change and then they'll change back and it'll be okay. So I guess acceptance, that's a terrible answer that there is no balance, but I guess I think that's true. No, I think I appreciate the, I appreciate the honesty because, you know, um, as you know, like, you know, influencers will put on a persona of this idealistic life. And that could be something as, as lame as getting your picture in front of some rad sports car and acting like it's yours to something maybe that's a little more polished and off off the rails of, of reality. But I mean, what you say is basically reality. I mean, I just came back yesterday from a trip in Seattle and I'm, I'm destroyed today. Like I was, I was napping right on my chair back there before we started. Cause I'm just like, dude, I gotta, gotta get my brain on. Um, so, so when you come home from like a, a, a trip, do you like give yourself like a buffer day or are you just like, you know, back in it? No, definitely a buffer day because, um, man, travel takes it out of you and it doesn't matter how far you go and then add teaching on top of it. Um, what a lot of people maybe don't realize is that when you're teaching, it's kind of like if you did a wedding and you come home and you're like, Whoa, I gave everything at that wedding. Mm -hmm. I'm exhausted. I feel the same way after teaching. I go into those experiences fully expecting to lay myself out, break myself open, give myself away. And then I got to kind of rejuvenate after that. Right. Um, and a lot of times coming home is, is like, it's hard because it's like there's needs here too. So the reality is that we're always kind of chasing it. But I think that this up here is where it all is. It's like understanding that nothing is that critical. Um, my family is healthy and they know that I love them and I'm doing my best at my business and I'm giving my best at my shoots and I'm giving my best when I teach and then I'm giving my best when I rest because that's what you got to do. Um, and it's okay to, it's okay to feel tired. I mean, I think you should, if you did it right, you should be tired. Right. So yeah, just accepting that you're not superhuman. And even though those pictures are great in front of those sports cars that nobody really owns, it's like the reality is that those people are tired too. And everyone's fighting for the same thing. And the, the, the reality is that the same thing is just really to be happy. And so that's kind of in my mind a choice, right? So it's like I can choose to have joy or I can choose to see it as stress. I feel like travel is a great opportunity. Teaching is an excellent opportunity. Photography is a great opportunity. And having a family is a great opportunity. All of those are dreams of mine. So in a minute, they become a nightmare. Is like I've lost. So just choosing to be joyful about even the stacks of laundry or the lack of groceries because I haven't had time to go or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I do. I do. I do a lot of laundry and a lot of cleaning here. And so does, so does Val. And it's just three, you know, it's just the three of us, but yeah, I, I get it. Um, and one thing you said about the teaching, uh, brought back a memory of, of when I first started getting into teaching, I was like, damn, this is really exhausting because not only do you have to shoot and do that properly, but you have to stop and slow down and explain to people why you're doing it a certain way. And then of course answer their questions in a way that helps them. And it's, it's, a uh, it's like, burning a candle at both ends. Cause like often when you shoot, you get into your different phases where some part is spiritual. Some part is just like mental creative. And some part is maybe physical stress if you got to move stuff. But when you're doing education, it's like all at the same time. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot. And I'm curious, like wh where, when did you start getting into the, the teaching? Was that 
before you started working with Olympus or was that somewhere down the line? I think, um, this is going to be a silly answer, but, um, it just, it does take me back. Cause I think like when you become a parent, you automatically become a teacher mm. because you, you know, I remember when my oldest again, who is 19 now was little, I used to, when I would do the dishes or make dinner or anything, I would be saying to him, Micah, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and this is why I'm doing this. And here's how you do this. And I just would be explaining things. And actually, the more I've gotten into teaching, the more I have to remind myself that that step by step, that that simplicity is really what everyone's looking for. It's like, but why, but why, but why? Right. So um, when I but the first time I ever taught a class class was for Olympus. And they said, hey, we want you to go teach this class. And I was like, oh, my gosh, they don't know what they're saying. Um, you know, because I was like, in my mind, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Um, and then I went and taught my first class and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I love this. This is amazing. Um, and over time I've refined my presentation and my communication and what I see that people are longing for photographers are longing for. And, um, and I'll always teach to that cause I, I love it. I just, it's a passion of mine as much as photography. So you're teaching business classes, posing, lighting, um, and then is there any other topics that you're teaching? Some maternity stuff I'll do. Okay. I teach some maternity. Um, and mostly those, though, I would say business and, and posing and lighting. Yeah. So what are you finding that people are, are, are longing for in these, these classes? What's the commonality? Well, the, the, the most common thing is like, man, I would love to get paid. <laughs> I, I would like to get paid. Just putting it out there. I, it's, it's so funny, but I mean, like, it sounds so simple. Um, but it's truly people want to get paid for their work. And I get it because when you're doing something that you love so much and you know how much you've put into it, you understand how you're like, you begin to think like, I really want to get paid for this not just for the sake of being paid, but so that you can continue to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think like most people are like, man, how do I get paid to do this? Um, and I think that's the, the number one thing. The second thing is that people want to always get better. It's a human condition to want the next best thing and not like car or piece of gear or whatever, but truly to be the next best thing that they can be, to create the next best image. Um, and so I think like going into classes, I always keep in mind that everyone who's there so that I don't get nervous, I always say everyone who's there wants the same thing as me to create the next best image, to make the next best amount of money to further themselves in some way. And so that's what I'm always trying to teach too. Yeah, that's so I was, I was like there, like you were talking about it. I was like, yeah, I was, I was like zoned out, uh, in that. Cause, <laughs> um, yeah, cause that's a struggle that, I mean, I think everyone faces when you have a business, whether you're just starting out or you've been doing it for years is, you know, trying to keep that, that income stream coming, um, which, which is tricky. Have, have you found over time that, um, like the, the, the fees are, have, have gone like smaller or bigger or, or what have you seen at least in your market that, that has, has changed when we've had like the, the, uh, eruption of like everyone with cameras and is it like a certain market segment that, that is like, yeah, we don't want to pay for it anymore because our cousin will do it for free. Do you feel like that has grown or what have you noticed in that, in that, uh, I certainly feel like there is a faction of people who, who do feel that way. Um, but this is why when I said at the beginning, my passions are always changing and like I'm always reaching for more because I understand that the influx of photographers in the industry, um, a lot of people view that as like they're ruining the industry and I get it. Um, I just feel like it's a great differentiation point. It's like, yeah, you can go get that for $99. And you know what? If that's what you're looking for, you should go get that for $99. Because I, I can't even do that anymore. I don't know that, I don't remember how to make pictures like that anymore. Um, even my worst work, 
now is better than that because I just, I, I and I'm not saying I wasn't ever there because I was. I mean, we all start somewhere. My first images were terrible, terrible and wonderful because they, they helped me so much. Um, I think that when we can differentiate ourselves as true professionals, and this isn't just about images, guys. This is about your presence. This is about your presentation. This is about so much more than just the imagery. It's about educating people. It's about all of that. When you become a true, trusted professional, people don't ever think it's going to be $99. Ever. You don't walk into the BMW dealership and think you're going to pay $599. I mean, you know better. You know, you know going in, you can't get a BMW for that price. Now, you might hope, but that's never going to happen, and you know it. Um, I think that that's the difference, is just differentiating yourselves. How, how can you do that? Well, you know, do some crazy stuff with adding new techniques. Add lighting. Add some gels. Add some movement. Get some poses down. Really have a plan. Get in there and really give people something that they can't get with their iPhone. That's number one. But then I'm going to turn around and tell you that there are people who have not great work that are making tons of money. So there's another part portion to it too, right? So the second side of it is the presentation side. It's who are you presenting yourself to the world as? And if you're a true trusted professional, people don't come to you and think that it's going to be cheap ever. When people email anymore, they don't email, you know, I, you know, I need a cheap shoot. Never. They don't ever say that. They're like, how much is this going to run me? You know, because they know. And so I think it's like really pointing the fingers back at ourselves, saying, how do I up my game? How do I make it clear that I am worth it? How do I make myself understand that I'm worth it? What, what, what price am I comfortable saying? And I say this all the time in my business classes. The first time you tell someone, a new price, even if it's only $50 old, then $50 more than your old price, it like you say it and it like sticks like peanut butter in the back of your throat. You just can't get it out. You're like, I want to say it, but it's not coming. And the, the price pit, it always tricks people up. But the bottom line is it doesn't matter what the price is. It only matters if you believe you're worth it. Because then when you say it, people are like, oh, okay. And, and inevitably people will come and say, you know, somebody came to me and I gave my wedding prices and they went and talked to somebody else. And then they came back and said, the other guy is $500 less expensive. And I always say, okay, what do you think they're asking you? And they say that they think that they're being asked to lower their pricing. And I think they're just saying, why are you $500 more worth it? And so you haven't given all the information. Um, I don't even know if I'm answering your question. I kind of went on a tangent. No, no, keep going. Keep, keep going. <laughs> it's just huge because... It's like more than a picture people are buying from you. Let's be honest. An 8x10 print is not worth $80. Yeah, and everybody knows it, right? Yeah, like it's not worth it. And your 10 minutes isn't worth $800 either. So we've got to get the value off of inches and minutes because it's not there. It, it is not there. It is, it is intrinsically an experience that people can have with you that they can't have anywhere else. And until you can create that experience, you're never going to feel comfortable selling minutes and inches for hundreds of dollars because you can't. Um, I don't know. I just, I feel like, look, like more than anything now, look at Instagram. People are doing crazy stuff to get a picture somewhere, to show people they had an experience somewhere. And you think they're going to buy inches and, and minutes? They're going to buy an experience because that's what everyone's doing now. And if you can be a part of that story, and you can make that impactful enough, you can sell anything for whatever price you want. It doesn't matter. Well said. Seriously, well said. Um, and it's super on point because you're right. People are like doing, people are dying on Instagram to get like this rad selfie in this rad spot. They're putting their life on the line. So surely there is, there is, there is value there in, in, in photography. And I think a lot of people miss that uh, aspect of it and especially miss the idea that, hey, you know, Instagram is sold for what, $3 billion or something to that effect? I mean, if photography wasn't worth it, I mean, would Zuckerberg wouldn't have been like, we're going to pay this money for it? But they did. Exactly. They did. And it, what is it? It's a photo sharing yep. site. And it's kind of technically 
one of the crappiest photo sharing sites because of what it does to your photos and the manipulation. Exactly. But yet it's worth billions of dollars because of the value that it, that that they realize that photography provides. How how are you building that value with with your your potential clients and your 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 current clients? So that's a that's a really superb question. So the first thing is yeah, good question. Um, the first question, the first thing that I always say to myself is how can I make people feel even more special when they come here? And so we have a studio, not everyone does. And I understand that, but, but I do think that I always say this like to our team, cause we work with the team now for most of our sessions. We have a hair and makeup artist and a stylist at every shoot. And then of course, Tony is our lighting specialist and he's always there moving the lights, making sure everything's perfect so that I can concentrate on shooting. So when people come into a shoot, or even come into the consultation. It's like anything else. What makes you feel special? When people show up, I always introduce myself. I always thank them for coming. Like that sounds so simple and stupid, but it's like, thank you for making the time to come here today. Because we're downtown Cincinnati. It's never an easy drive because downtown Cincinnati is always a train wreck. So it's like, thank you for coming here, for doing this. And offering people a drink giving people a tour. I know these all sound like simple things, but it's like the, the common is so uncommon anymore of just like plain hospitality. Um, and then giving people the opportunity to choose what they want, but really directing them professionally to choose what you know they actually need. Um, and I think like when people come into the studio space, they're a little nervous. Like a lot of people haven't worked with a professional photographer before. You know, and so it's like, what do they expect when they come in and being able to show them the space and explain what we're going to do together and asking their opinion and getting their story. I always do what we call. I, I don't know if you knew this or not, but I come from the background of sales, actually, and I was in corporate sales for years and I was like at the top of my game. I worked for a Fortune 500 company. I was in the the way upper echelon of, of the sales team and I, I will never forget how it felt whenever I was selling to people because what people really wanted to, to do was to be heard. They wanted me to listen. And um, it's the same with photography. People really want to tell their story. They want to be heard. So when people come in, we do a needs assessment. And I write down everything they tell me, everything. From like what color or, you know, how many kids they have and how old they are and what their names are and, I mean, anything they want to tell me, I'm there for it. I want to listen. Um, by the end of the day, what people really want is connection, just like me. That's what I want. Um, so I think that that's part of it. And then educating people. It's like, you want to believe how many people, I say, what size prints do you think you would want at the end of the day when we get done, your family picture's done, what size print do you want? Well, what size do you think people say? I don't know, 8 by 10? Yeah. They say eight by 10. You know why? Because it's the only size they know. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, people don't know. If I say what's after eight by 10, they go, uh, or maybe they can squeak out 11 by 14. But then if I say what's after that, they don't know. 16 by 20, they have no clue. And so then the education part is taking an eight by 10 and holding it above the couch at the studio. And then they go, oh, that's way too small. Right. They Got don't it. know that an eight by 10 is too small. And so the education piece comes in where it's like, oh, I think you would probably like something like this, bringing out a larger print, a 20 by 30, and holding that above the couch and saying this would look really nice above your sofa. You know, being able to give people, look like we assume everyone's as creative as we are, but the, the reality is that most people can't even visualize what they would hang on their wall. Um, so we have a little bit of responsibility to bring that kind of knowledge to people so that they can purchase from us in a smart way that doesn't feel like they're losing something. And then the other part for, I, I know it sounds crazy too, but when people leave the studio after a consultation, I always text them and say, thank you so much for coming in and meeting with us. And I always try to get at least three thank yous in that first time that I meet them. Um, and it's amazing. People write me back and say, oh my gosh, thank you so much. It was so fun or whatever. Um, just to keep them in a, in an attitude of gratitude. Cause I am grateful for them because they're, they're helping to pay my bills and further my business. And so expressing gratitude, I think is really important. Yeah. I love, I love it. I love it. Um, 
you don't hear a whole lot about what you're, everything you're talking about. It's probably why you are where you are. Um, that's great. Cause there, I mean, there is so much like weird, I don't, I don't say negativity, but there's all this weird vibes right now in the photo world. I don't know if you're feeling it on your end, but between like all these camera systems that are coming out and people saying the world is falling and you know, the, this system is dying and the, this profession is dying. Like, I feel, I feel like every day is a new article about that. Um, about that. I mean, and you probably hear this, right? You, do you, do you hear this stuff from people at your, at the, at the shows? Sure. So what, what oh, yeah. I, you know, I mean, what, they're coming up to you. What are they saying? Like, Hey, you know, the photo, I mean, what are they saying and how are you dealing with this? So, so the general consensus, I think sometimes can be very negative when there's change. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's funny because as creatives, you'd think that we crave change. We should. Um, I do. I know, I know you do what I do. I really do. And I think what people are feeling or sensing is giant change. And the fear that's feeding into that is where do I fit in that change? Is there a place for me in that change? Well, that's up to you. You have to be willing to create a place for yourself in that change. And that's what makes us creatives. And that's what makes us artists is being able to see that change and say, oh, I see how I could make that change something that I want in my life. Um, and just trying to remember that everything doesn't have to be how it is to be okay. It can be different and you know, you can still find your place in a changing environment and industry. I mean, the industry is changing a hundred percent. It's changing, but it doesn't mean that it's going away or that it's going down the tank. Like people like to say, um, and people just get afraid because there's change and, I'll, above all else, learn how to embrace the change and you're not going to feel negatively about it. But I mean, I think that's just my perspective because I like change. Well, what, what changes are you seeing uh, right now that's kind of disrupting things? Um, I would say that I don't know if there's necessarily a disruption. <clears throat> I know when we talked earlier, we were talking about how, how many people were kind of flooding the photography industry. Like five to eight years ago, it seemed like it was like... Phew, Everybody's a photographer. Um, and people were really upset by that. Man, photographers were just like going off, like mom with a camera. And now it's like the photography industry is like, yes, moms with cameras. Let's get them, you know, because that's the new wave of photographers, right? Um, and so some people in the industry got really smart and said, hey, those are our peeps. Let's get them, you know? Um, and they were right these moms with cameras are super powerful beings that are running around running the industry now. And are doing and really good work too, by the they're way. They're doing amazing work. Ama I'm one of them. I'm a mom with a camera. I mean, that's how I came into this thing. But I think, um, you know, things that people think is that, you know, professional photography is dying because everyone has a camera. Well, that's silly. I mean, like, that's ridiculous. That's like saying that doctors are no longer going to be needed because we have WebMD. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's not true. Um, but I do think that it. what is happening is that the requirement is that you show yourself to be a professional photographer. So you have to raise the bar. You have to get yourself to a level where you can actually be considered professional and you set yourself apart. And it doesn't mean you have to be an Olympus visionary or any of those other things. It can just mean that you run a really good business with a really tight ship and you take really great images. That's it. And the images, by the way, are secondary to running a great business. Because like I said, there are a ton of photographers who have okay work and are making tons of money because they're running a great business. All right. That, that, so. that is the truth. And I, when I was a young man, I would really, you know, I was a young ego driven dude and that would, uh, that would irk me every time. I'm like, dude, their work is so yeah. just, just lame and generic, but man, they're just like cracking, like they're like retirement squared away. And like, and here I am making this original stuff. And like, I'm like struggling, you know, when I, when I first started yeah. out. It's so true. And, and I think that everyone kind of struggles with that. And I think that that's the fear in the industry is that professional photography is going away. It's like, no, just become more professional. The line gets the, you know, the divide gets greater. And, and 
and you know what? Some people will be left on the other side. I get it. Mm-hmm. It's fine. But um, if it's truly your passion, you'll find a way to make it live. Yeah, totally. I mean, and some things do change. Like editorial is not what it used to be. Um, I True. mean, it used to be, you know, in the mid 2005 to 2008, like I made a majority of my income off of magazines. But, I, you know, and I was shooting maybe 10 or so assignments a month, covers and interiors and stuff. And then as the web started coming along, that died off. And then all the cinemagraph stuff that I was doing uh, died off in 2000. And, it was, you know, as they die off and they come back, it's just like, well, then you just, you change or you go do something else and, and you just deal with it, right? I mean, the other, yeah. change, the other change has been like, especially lately, I feel like, um, there's been this huge, as far as like the gear, like just all these young, I call them brotographers coming in, not to diss on guys. I mean, I, hello, I am a guy, but they're just like, let me go out and get the biggest sensor and make it look like everybody else's work, but then they want to shoot. And it's like, they're, you know what it's like, Tracy, it's kind of like in the hip hop world, you see people, they, they dress like quote unquote, a rapper uh, they look like they're ready to rhyme, but they can't rhyme. And we're seeing that a lot with photography and seeing these young people that are get, getting themselves out head to toe with like all sorts of gear. And then when it comes to actually doing the job, they're not able to really fulfill on not just the the role of, of a professional, uh, but also making the imagery. And here you are with a uh, micro four thirds camera, which to the bros, it's just kind of like, well, you can't do this and that. And, and obviously you can do all that stuff. I don't need to make a list of it, but are you, are you encountering like uh, when you're, when you're teaching and stuff, people that, that are like, why are you using uh, the smaller sensor? Cause even though, and I know that, you know, that every it's not just the sensor it's just like a portion of the camera, but it seems to be the default topic when, when, when people don't know any better. So Obviously, you know, you have Olympus that's doing really good with their marketing, but how are you talking, you know, people come and they ask you this stuff. What do you, how's that conversation go? So I, I be honest with you, like I don't get a lot of pushback. And I think like I get this question a lot whenever I do any interviews. Um, everyone always asks me like, what's the pushback? And I maybe we'll have people ask me, can you print large with that or which I think is such a silly question because of course you can. And there's so much more that goes into printing than just what comes out of your camera. But, um, but then I also like, I think the other part is um, when people ask me questions about the gear, like, well, you could use anything. Why do you choose that? Um, As if it's like some kind of like dark choice or something. (laughs) I I don't know like what people are thinking, but, um, but the funny thing is that I can honestly to this day say the, the, remember how I was saying everything right now is about experience mm-hmm. for my client. It's all about experience. I can't sell inches. I can't sell time. I can sell minutes and inches for only a certain amount, but experience, that's a totally different thing. So if I can sell an experience, when I be thinking the same way about my experience with my gear, so ergonomically hands down, there is nothing I've held in my hand that feels better to me than the camera that I use. That's huge for me because my camera's in my hand a lot. Because like you said, I'm shooting a lot of the time. And so for me, the ergonomics are huge. I want it to feel good. I want it to feel like an extension of my hand. And then also, I don't want big heavy gear. And I don't feel like I'm missing anything by not using big heavy gear. Um, Now, you know, people will come and, and ask me about stuff like that. But I don't really get a lot of pushback on other things. I think that the sensor argument is so silly. I mean, it's silly. And well, and it'll go on forever. I mean, it's the war of the ages. It's never going to stop. And I'm Sadly. totally used to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, it's like whatever. And, and every once in a while, I'll be somewhere and someone will bring it up and say something. And then I'm just like, okay, well, here, why don't you look at this? six foot by nine foot image that was printed by Olympus and shown at the trade show. I mean, like, I don't know. I made that with my camera, with my teeny tiny sensor. And, and so it's just, um, I prefer to make silent the naysayers just by making great images. (laughs) I guess that's the best way. No, I, 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 I agree. I'm, I'm all there with you. Cause I remember when, 
I had my first um, Micro Four Thirds. It was a Pen Mini that I got in a contest from Olympus. Oh, okay. And I had it in mm-hmm. my bag with my DSLR, and I'm shooting all these assignments with my DSLR in here. And it's and it's just been in there as a behind-the-scenes camera. And then one day I looked at the images, and I'm like, oh, they're actually good. They're actually – it's a good file. It's not the same. It's different. Yeah. It's not better or worse. It's different. Yeah. So then I started shooting with a pen mini, which I still have. It's my little red one. And I started shooting um, covers with the pen mini in low light. I shot in low light. I shot in bright light. And I'm like, mm-hmm. this – actually is getting the job done. And then I sold um, everything, all my DSLR stuff six months later, even though I was, I stopped using it, but it was like this fear of like, Oh, I'm going to find out one thing. I'm going to find that one thing. Yeah. And I never found that one thing with the micro four thirds that I was uh, where it was actually a deal breaker. Now there are differences between every format, medium formats, you know, micro four thirds, DSLR or uh, 35, whatever. But I never found like that one thing that I was just like, I can't do that. In fact, it was the opposite. Like, like you had mentioned, like when the camera wasn't blocking my eyes and I'm having a, a, a human to human connection using a live view, I'm like that by itself got me images I could not get otherwise. And then I also had people have conversations with me about the gear, the subjects they are like, that's really cool looking. Why is that lens silver? And something about that. And it's, it sounds silly, but something about that really broke down these barriers and I put the camera in their hand and they would play with it. Oh, cool. And then when we would shoot, it was like this natural progression from hanging out to shooting. Um, and that's kind of like what I got out of it where I was just like, this is, everyone needs to be doing this. You yes. know, um, I just, I, you know, I, I, um, I don't really know where I'm going with this, but I just like, I just like, you know, when I hear people talking, you got to have a full, it's like, I call them the full frame zombies and there's nothing wrong with full frame for people that are listening. There's nothing wrong with it. But when you focus on the more important things, then is like, you know, maybe you do have a larger sensor, but is everything else, what's the whole package and how is it getting you, uh, to that vision, um, in a more, uh, honest way in a, in a quicker way than other stuff. And the, often the answer for people is no with the bigger cameras. Don't you think, though, that, and I always, like, in my conversations with, like, photographers as I'm sitting down with friends that are photographers, I'm always like, you know, a truly skilled photographer could take a awesome picture with any camera, any camera, right? Because we all know if we're being honest, it's not the camera, it's the lenses and the lighting anyway. Right. Like, right? Like, if you're going to buy something new, I'll tell you all day long and twice on Tuesday, buy some lenses and buy some lighting. They're, they are the where it's at, right? A great camera is awesome, don't get me wrong, but the reality is that there are iPhone pictures that are covers of magazines. Mm-hmm. An awesome photographer is what makes an awesome image, not an awesome camera. And so I just wish that people would get away from that whole thing because it really does... Like you're saying, it brings people in and says, if you buy this blah, blah, blah camera, I almost said some letters and numbers, but if you buy this blah, blah, blah camera, you're going to be an awesome photographer. But at the end of the day, awesome photography is made by skilled photographers, not cameras. Right. And so we have to get away from that talk um, so that people can actually find themselves creating true art again. And that's where it really all is, you know. It is. And it's all about that personal self-expression and sharing that with other people. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, we're only going to live so long. And you want to be like, you know, I've I've done um, the stuff that I'm, I'm proud of pretty much everything I've done or whatever. Um, yeah. But you're, you're totally on the mark, though. It's like it is all about the glass and all about the light. It's like because the, the camera bodies change every 18 to 20 Five seconds. Right, right. It's like every 18 months or whatever it is, you know, and so, yeah, there'll be an incremental upgrade to whatever's out now, but man, a good, a good lens is a good lens. And it is, it, it's not like all of a sudden not going to be a good lens tomorrow. No, it's like timeless. Right, yeah. right. Um, which is why, and you know, I could say this now because I have no official sponsorship, but after, um, leaving, uh, the sponsorship I have with Panasonic, which was a fantastic experience. I was like, all right, I'm going to try a little of everything. And, and, uh, I scratched that itch cost me a lot of money. 
and a lot of pain. It always does. <laughs> and now I'm 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 full circle. I still have a, a Fuji kit which I'm I like, but um, I'm not sure where that where that's gonna go. But I'm like playing with Micro Four Thirds again. Like man, I forgot how awesome this was. I can hold these at weird angles and get shots like on vacation that I just couldn't get before. Yeah. And it's like, so if I couldn't get the shot with a camera that maybe is a little better in lower light, but I couldn't get it because the screen didn't move a certain way, then what's the point? Whereas mm-hmm. I have, a, I have a, a pro camera I can put in, in Roman's diaper bag when I'm hanging out with him and get awesome photos of him. And then if I see somebody on the street while we're hanging out, I get a rad photo of them and I don't have to be like, you know, well, I, I, I took a less uh, capable camera and lens because it's so big i needed it down it's like no i have the something awesome and i'm always able to create and i totally had missed that for the last two years and not realizing it until until recently so the i mean when it comes to glass though it's like i think there, i don't think there's anything better than the the micro four third standard because there's so much awesome lenses what, what's your really are. what are your go-to lenses for your system well, if anyone who follows my work online knows that like the 45 millimeter pro F12 is like, I, it almost never leaves my camera. I had to push myself like, oh, today I'm going to use the 40 to 150. Because if not, I'll just forget about everything else because I just love it so much. Um, but I then find myself sometimes using weird angles for portraits that most people don't use like I'll use a seven to 14 and get down really low and make some weird long legs or whatever. Um, but in general, I think, um, my favorite is definitely the 45 one too. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, and then I also like my old standard is that 12 to 40 cause it's a F two eight. It's constant aperture. It's sharp every time it works like as a portrait lens, as a macro lens, it's just got so many great qualities. Um, so yeah, I think like, I really do find myself gravitating toward the primes because I, I don't know, I like the control of having to like get up and move my feet if I want to change something or, but more than anything, I just love that F12 aperture. I love it so much. So do you, do you shoot with that lens and wide open at F12? I do usually. Yes. Wow. Wow. That's gotta be really cool. It really is because it's sharp. I mean, like, like it's sharpest at one, two. And it's just, it's unreal. It's gorgeous. So that's basically what makes that lens cost what it costs and is a wide open performance, right? Oh, yeah. And it's quick. Okay. It's And it's it's on it. Okay. Because I've had, I shot a lot of the work with the, the Olympus 4518. I want to say it is the small one. And mm-hmm. that lens was all right, wide open, but at F4, it came alive. It was just like a whole yep. nother, it was awesome. I was like, dude, I'm shooting everything at F4. I'm just going to lock it on F4. Uh, but we with, need to hook you up with trying that one too, because boy, that is life changing. Is it really? Oh yeah, it's so good. So, oh. so how are you How are you balancing then your pro photo strobes with, with shooting wide open? Because you're obviously using a faster shutter speed at that point, right? Right. So I have all of the, um, so I have, I have so many pro photo things, but, um, I have the B1X or the, yeah, the B1X kit. I have the B2s. I have the B10s. Um, so, and I have the A1s, so I use whatever is appropriate, but, um, in studio, I find myself stopping down some, so I might shoot at two eight or whatever, um, if I need to. Um, because the, the strobes are too, are too much power, but I don't have the thousand watt. I have the 500 watt kit. So that does help me as well. Um, also I love the giant umbrella from them. So the, the XL umbrella, it does take away some of the power as well because it's so large. So once you put the strobe in there, you're losing like one or two stops. So you're getting a little less light as well. And I think that's one reason why I like it so much because it's so soft and gorgeous. So, yeah. So the, the A1s, and for people that are listening that are not familiar, those are the on-shoe, on-camera flash. Um, does Profoto actually make that spe- for the Micro Four Thirds standard or are you using a different, a different mount? 
So the A1 is not for Olympus specifically. There's one for Canon and Nikon, and then they just came out the A1X, and that is a Sony specific. Interesting. Okay. So, so um, there isn't one specifically for Olympus, but the cool thing about the Profoto stuff is that if you're not using it in TTL, you can use the manual on top of your Olympus, and it will still trigger. Um, you just need to set the power. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, then you could still use it wirelessly, though, with the TTL. Correct. Okay. You can still trigger your other lights. So say I'm at a wedding and I have the A1 on top, I can then trigger my B10s that are on the dance floor. Oh, okay, got it, got it. What I was thinking is having the, mm-hmm. the controller on your Olympus that's Olympus compatible, and then would it, would it then control TTL, the A1s? That would definitely do it, yes. Oh, nice. So you could either use a bracket or just use it off camera if you wanted to do that. But the A1 also doubles as a controller for the other Profoto gear. That's so cool. So it's, it's also a transceiver, yes. Okay, okay, wow. Do you have a favorite, do you have like a favorite Profoto? Like if you had to like choose one now, mm. don't think about it, just spit it out. What, what would it be? It would, it would definitely be the B10 oh, okay. because the B10s are, um, right, so they're great constant light as well, which is controllable by both power and temperature, oh, Okay. which is awesome. Really? And they put out a very nice amount of power. So like yesterday I was doing a newborn session, which we really haven't talked a lot about, but I was doing a newborn session and I don't use flash photography on my newborns um, because it's just disruptive. I mean, it's hard for them to sleep through that kind of thing. So but the B10s, I can shape the light, right? It's not just a typical LED, which is like a panel or something. I can shape the light with all my Profoto light shaping stuff. So I can use a softbox or a beauty dish or whatever I want. And I still have enough power with my LED lighting through the B10 to be able to shoot and shape light without having any kind of strobes going off. Really nice. That's awesome. Also, I mean, like controlled by your phone on an app. So you can use the Profoto Connect, which is just a little, basically, little controller that only has, you know, manual, TTL, and off. Okay. So you're not doing all the buttons on there. And then you control everything through the Profoto app. Okay, nice. Really cool, really cool technology. That, so so then you basically, you're lighting your newborns with the constant light. You're controlling the temperature. That's cool. Are, are you doing any video with, with those those lights? Um, so they are great for video as well. Um, we'll use it for video in the studio. I haven't used it as a video light on location for like a wedding or something, but, um, I only because I've not had them for very long and I haven't tried that yet, but they would work. I mean, like, it's amazing how much light they actually put out. Like for my newborn session, I put it, put the light in my XL umbrella and have a diffuser panel on it. And I use it, um, as an LED light in that giant XL umbrella for my newborns to get that big soft light. Man, that's so good. I mean, that's awesome for LED. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, because LEDs typically are not powerful at at all. Mm-hmm. Which because because if they are, at some point people start to squint because obviously it's a lot of light. How how are you? Because I, I, we have not talked about newborns, and I am curious. How, how how are you getting them to to stay still? Are they like a, are they actually like asleep? I'm like I because I see them. I'm just like what what? How did you do this? It's so funny. Everyone asks the same question because it's it's whenever I put up a video of a newborn session, people say, "Oh my gosh, can you call me? I thought they'd be crying the whole time. I want to book a session." Um, you know, I always say this, and I'm I'm kind of a I'm kind of a woo woo person, like right. So like I. I'm like, oh, I believe in everything. But but the truth is that, like, newborns are little sponges, right? So I was like, how do you keep a newborn calm? It's like, well, then you be calm. Right, because right. Because they're just feeding off of all of your energy. So we, are, we always set the atmosphere, right? I have lavender oil diffusing. We have white noise going in the studio. It's way too warm for me, but just perfect for them. And when they come in, it's nice and relaxed. We're not in a hurry. We're not trying to get anything. We're just getting baby comfortable and getting baby into a position that we love and taking all the time we need to do that. Um, And I think like that's the biggest key. If I could say there's anything that's key, it's like, what's your energy like? Are you clean right now? Are you worried about something? Are you upset about something? Because if you are, a baby will be. Um, And as a parent, I can say that that is 
absolutely true. Because in times when the boys were little and they wouldn't sleep or something would happen and then I would want them to calm down, but I was upset. They couldn't calm down because they were reading my energy. So I think that's the first thing. But then it's also little keys like knowing that they need warmth and they need constant sound and they need, you know, a nice clean atmosphere to get comfy in. Yeah. So then you get down pretty low with them or using like the articulating screen so that you're not having to like crawl around on the ground or what does that, that look like? So I have a like a posing thing that I use that brings them up off the ground. So I'm sitting oh, in a right. chair. Completely. Okay. Like one of the, <clears throat> one of the things that we haven't talked about, which I love about the micro four thirds gear is that it's promoting my longevity as a photographer. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. You can't do this forever if you're killing yourself all the time. Right. And so weight is huge. People think that it's funny to carry around a giant camera and like, oh, yeah, my sensor this, my sensor that. But the reality is if in 10 years you're crippled because your neck is dead and you can't you have carpal tunnel or whatever, um, I really think it's important to think about the longevity piece. And um, with newborns, it's like important not to be crawling around on the floor all the time, especially if like our studio is all hardwood. Mm. hardwood floors so it's like that would be that would kill me after a while yeah so i have a very comfortable chair i can sit in a yoga ball chair and pose the baby on a bean bag and do all my work without killing myself and that's really important to me because i do want to do this long term this is my this is my passion like i'm not just doing it to make money mm -hmm. so i want to do this for forever so i protect myself in that way that's that's great. I'm so happy to hear that because I I have my yoga ball right there and right over there I got my yeah. my uh, essential oil diffuser. Yep, there you go. <laughs> it's so important. I mean, yeah. do, are you doing anything else uh, for like your own personal wellness uh, to kind of get into the zone? Like I meditate every morning. I write uh, in a I. paper journal and stuff. And are, are you finding anything in particular beyond those that kind of kind of so, so like, I think there's a couple of things that I, are for me essential. And that is like meditation is a huge part for me. Mm -hmm. Like I, on days I don't meditate, I might as well not even go out into the world cause I'm just going to be a mess. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I do yoga, um, because I love stretching and I feel like a lot of times I'm sitting in my computer, like 90% of the time editing or, you know, shooting, carrying gear. So stretching for me is a huge thing. Um, and then um, another thing is I love to read and I like to write as well, but I love to read. And so education for me is huge. I am constantly educating myself as much as I love to educate other people. So um, those are the things I do for my sanity, I think. What are you reading right now that's inspiring you? So I'm reading a book called The Power of Now. Oh, yeah, I can totally um, Yes. And, no, 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 exactly. Um, and I'm loving it. I love everything about it. It's really, um, I, I love books like that. I love any kind of like self help. I, I'm also reading. I'm also reading a book called. It's by I think Brendan Kane, and it's called One Million Followers. Okay. Um, and it's a book about like Instagram and Facebook marketing and stuff. Oh, cool. And so I like stuff like that too. So I'm I try to diversify a little bit. I'm never reading one book. I'm always reading like 16 books, which I should get better at. But the book that I'm really into right now is The Power of Now. Okay. Recommend it highly for everyone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great it, book. It's, man, it's awesome. I have it in on audio form as well because Eckhart Tolle himself reads it, which I will say his voice is so chill and very heavy German accent. I do find myself falling asleep to it often, but. I'll let it play. He's like, and now we talk about the pain body. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm done. Good night. <laughs> and I, and I, I wake up in the morning and it's like wrapping up, you know, and I'm like, oh, wow. So I'm hoping I, to kind of, yeah, I'm hoping it kind of programs itself in my head. Um, yeah, yeah. There's a really cool book you may want to check out called A Whole New Mind by Daniel Ooh. Pink. It's great because it talks about, I mean, he wrote this, I want to say in 2004. 2003 something like that but he talks about how everything in the future is, is going to be based around art automation and asia asia basically if it's creativity if it's unique if it's something that only you can do um that elevates you if it's something that can be automated it will be so don't do a job where you know something can be automated and don't do a job that can be sent uh overseas to be done for less because then 
you know, but an awesome type of, uh, awesome for, for creators. Uh, who was inspiring you now for like visuals, like photography? Where are you finding that, that juice? Oh man. So gosh, it's such a hard question. Cause I want to point to someone like famous that everyone knows. Nah, nah, but let the, rip. Reality is, the reality is that like Instagram is a great platform for all kinds of inspiration. So there are so many photographers that nobody knows about that are just killing it with regard to creativity. So I find myself on Instagram all the time just seeing people with 1,000 followers that are just out of this world. Um, so I hate to say it, but some of that. And then also I find myself just looking at art in general, like paintings, mm -hmm. and finding some inspiration there. Um I, I wish I could point to someone like, you know, well known that I really find inspiration from, but I think it's just like, there's so much out there now. I feel like Instagram is an inspiration for me because I mean, you can look up hashtag anything and find inspiration for something. And the other thing is that I, I don't know if I, I don't know. I I'm inspired by so many things. Like I literally, one of the, my newest obsessions is, in the morning after I meditate, I go outside and I sit on my back deck and I close my eyes and I just listen mm. because like there's like every kind of bird and bug and bee and everything else and the breeze and the leaves and the grass and so many sounds that just like I would miss if I just didn't take a second. So like I think inspiration's everywhere if you just are looking for it, I guess. Yeah, yeah that that's fantastic. I do something similar as well, be able to slow down and just, just be present and not put my face on a screen for a minute. Um, I feel, I feel as a, not only a better person, but a better photographer. And I think that's stuff that, that is not discussed enough, uh, in the world of yes. photography, right? It's so true. Where, yeah. Where do you, where, where do you see yourself going in the near future creatively or where do you, where do you want to, to steer your, your ship? Uh, it's an interesting question because I just kind of, I just, it just kind of came to me. Um, <laughs> uh, recently, I was doing a shoot and I realized that I really want to do some mixed media stuff. So I'm starting to do a little bit more of that and I'm finding some interesting creativity through um, doing mixed media art and drawing other artists into. So I, I it, and this is weird because I think I should have been maybe more aware of it sooner, but sometimes I'm, Ooh, I miss things. They go right over my head. Same, same, yeah. But, um, <laughs> when we went to Iceland and did a shoot for Olympus and we took the pictures of this giant ship at Ocranes, I don't know if you saw those images, but they're some of my favorite images and there's this giant shipwreck. And when we came back, the building that our studio is in is all artists. And so, um, one of the artists in the building is a painter and he saw the image and he was so, he loved it so much. He said, I would like to use this, this image as a piece that I can recreate and with my own spin. So as it turns out, he's doing this whole painting. Um, and he's like amazing. If you haven't checked him out, checked out Jimmy Jones art. He's been in the Smithsonian. He's been at the all over in New York, everywhere. His art is in the museums, but he is using that as an inspiration for some of his work. And I should have then thought, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. But I'm starting to use other artists' art, collaborating with them to create pieces that speak to me or give a message that I want to leave to the world or whatever. So that's next. So is that, is that what you're talking about as far as like mixed media or are you collaborating or what? So some of it could be collaboration, but a lot of it I think would be mixed media. Like maybe I'm using someone's painting as the backdrop. Maybe I, okay. you know, something like that. Um, just trying to put some art together to make super art. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I get it. I think that's, that's fantastic. And I think <laughs> the the thought of that probably freaks out a lot of people because now they're like, it's not all mine. It's not all about me. It's about a collaborative piece. Um, has that come up for you at all? Like any kind of fears around, around this stuff? I tell you, like this whole thing is just like, 
I, I hate to always bring everything back to parenting, but it's so funny. They're, they're very similar because, you know, when your child is born, they need everything from you. And then they start to grow up and they need less and less and less and less until eventually they truly don't need you anymore in a physical sense, you know, right? So um, I think true art is the ability to let go of it a little bit. The art itself becomes its own thing. And, um, you know, working, as I was mentioning earlier, with influencers, it's like giving up some control. And we are control freaks, but at the same time, letting go a little bit offers it the art and ability to take on a life of its own. So I'm learning how to do that. And it's it's a challenge for me, for sure. But I like challenges, so... Okay, so I'm going to ask you about letting go here in a second, but um, so Roman is going to be three at the end of next month. He's already starting to do things like take my hand and if I'm holding his hand and pull it away and, you know, because he wants to be like, you know, the little big dude. Realistically, how much time do I got before? Uh, oh, hey, dude, that's him. How much how much time do I got uh, <laughs> before? Come here, Roman, before I'm not able to, to, to snuggle him all the time. You know, it's funny. It kind of does depend on the child because my youngest is 15 and he still wants to snuggle. Sometimes. Oh, okay. Um, so it depends on the child. I think, I think some kids just want to snuggle all the time. Um, but everybody needs to snuggle sometimes. Right. So I think, um, I always used to say when, when the kids were that little, he is so cute. Oh my gosh. Um, and so, uh, curious about everything. Right? Yeah. Hi Roman. How are you? Can you hear me? No. Can you say hi? Hi. 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 Oh, hi. <laughs> You're so cute. Hi. That's Tracy. Can you say hi, Tracy? A... Hi, Tracy. Hi. Is that a tattoo on your arm? Roman, is that a tattoo? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. You're going to go hang out with mommy? Okay, say bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay. That totally was not planned. He just, uh, you know, wanted to come what in here. It yeah. was perfect timing. You're like, how much time do I have? And like zero seconds. <laughs> right, right. And then he comes walking in. It's almost, uh, it's in a way, it's it's almost as cool as a cat in the internet. But, you know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> So, it really is. Uh, so anyway, about, um, and if, I guess for people that are listening, that was my son that kind of came in and, um, was it a, a podcast bomb or how do we, anyways, <laughs> uh, so it's turn in terms of giving away your work, right? I mean, there's this, a lot of it, I, I feel like there's, there's like, there's like this general fear among photographers, this like scarcity mindset. So let's not put our photos on Instagram without a watermark or let's just not put it on at all because someone will take your image and use it, which has happened to me many times. Um, so me too. Are, are you, I mean, are, are, how are you coming to terms with giving away quote unquote your work on Instagram and I guess just letting it, letting it live like you were, like you were saying. Yeah, I think there's a certain measure of like making sure like you don't we only regret something when we don't get what we feel we deserve for it up front. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times we aren't staying up for ourselves in that way. So like say if I do a shoot for a client and I didn't charge what I know I should charge and then I put the images up and then they steal them by like reposting them on social or whatever guess whose fault that is like that's my fault like I didn't charge enough so I think like it's kind of terms with like what do I need to charge so that I feel good about letting the art live because if we're creating these things aren't we creating them so people can see them and they can touch people's lives or what are we creating them for like in my mind I I think all the time I want to create things so that it can move people like I want someone to see it and feel something, but nobody can feel anything if they can't see it. So at some point we have to be willing to let the art be the art that it needs to be. And like you said, the best way um, that I could have even thought of saying it is giving it room to breathe. Like it needs to breathe. People need to see it. Um, 
And there is a scarcity mindset. People are like, well, I'm not getting, I'm not getting what I deserve. And so then it becomes this whole thing. I think um, it's, it's an interesting thought to let the work breathe and let it see the light of day so that it can be appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know what comes to mind is Vivian Mayer. Like she's an amazing photographer and she hid, uh, you know, from society. Like, and we, none of us have the opportunity to learn from her directly because she was just never out there. And just, I'm just like thinking about yep. that. I'm like, wow, for a moment, if she were out there, I mean, wow, I don't even know what that would be, but I think it would be powerful. And how many people are like her, right? Cause I see a lot of, uh, quote unquote amateurs online. I'm like, damn, they're really good. They're really good. I'm like, don't, yeah. don't, don't come to my town and open up business. <laughs> but, <laughs> kidding about that part. But, you know, I'm inspired by a lot of, uh, amateur photographers. I would say in some ways more than professionals because they're shooting the, you know, the passion, but a lot of them are like, well, I don't want to share this here because, because this may or may not happen. And then in the meantime, it's like, well, then what's, what, 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 what are you, what are you doing? Because no one's going to find your work when you're dead and no one's got the password to your hard drive or, or whatever, you know? Yeah. I think all in all, it's a fear that we won't be truly seen. Right. So when people are afraid of that, it's like the fear is the work goes out there and no one recognizes that I'm the one that did it. And that happens um, though. I mean, that's the reality of it. It does. It certainly does. But it also is a danger because the danger becomes just like Instagram, like is, well, this picture didn't do so good on Instagram. So is it a good picture? It's like, it only got this many likes. So does that make it a bad picture? I think it's, it's hard in our society because people are, are defining themselves by how people respond to things instead of defining themselves by what came out of them. And that's a, that's a very dangerous and, and kind of sad thing. It's like, if you create something that you're proud of, then be proud of it. Um, and let it, let it live. I don't know. I just feel like, and I get it because I struggle. Everyone struggles with it. It doesn't matter who you are. The worthiness game is always a struggle. It's like, is it good enough? Is my work good enough? Am I, you know, Am I too fat? Am I too skinny? Am I, do I have enough of this? Am I, there's always those things. Um, but the reality is that we got to get over it and just start sharing ourselves with each other again, because it, the, it's amazing how the connectedness and the lack of true connection is just astounding. It's such a conundrum. It's such a weird thing. It's like, we are more connected now than we've ever been with less deep connections than we've ever had. And because of that, everyone's afraid because they feel like they're fighting for attention, I guess. I don't know. It's a weird thing. Yeah. It's all the, the fears that come up w within us. I mean, I still have moments where I feel like an imposter and, and, and I will say up until, so I released, um, some micro four thirds profile and presets for Lightroom recently. And I was kind of putting a little bit about me in there, which normally I don't like to do, but then I, but this one time I actually, I, I started to think about like, what did, what did I do? What are the highlights of my career? And I was like, wow, actually, you know what? I've done some really cool stuff and I felt genuinely good about it. Whereas, uh, I've never really had, uh, before. And I was like, huh, okay, cool. And I felt, I felt good uh, about that, but it's like, you know, so many times, I mean, I'd be on like on stage at photo plus and there's like, you know, 300 people in this thing and they're like, we're here to see you. And I'm like, really? I'm like, what, what, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. Oh no. And there are still those moments for me too. I think that that's everyone. Even sometimes when you're at a shoot and something goes a little sideways and you're like, do I know what I'm doing? Like, am I? And I think that knowing that everyone's going through the same thing helps. But then also just like bringing it down to, to basic stuff. It's like everyone's human and we're all there for the same thing. And it's all about that connection. And, you know, not expecting perfection from yourself and knowing that things are going to be out of balance and knowing that things are going to go crazy sometimes and being okay with it and knowing that everyone else is facing the same thing. It helps. And it helps when there aren't people that, that always are making everything look perfect. You know, because we're always putting our best foot forward, but 
the end of the day, it's the tip of the iceberg. For every amazing image you see of mine, there's like a thousand that really suck, you know? Sure. It's like, you know, or more. I'm being generous to myself. But, you know, that's the way of it. It's like you got you to gotta fail a whole, whole bunch. You see someone successful, just know they really failed a lot. Oh, I mean, yeah. you know, a lot, a lot. Yeah. I always think that when I see people that are super successful, I hear people, you know, complaining that they're too, they're goody goody or they're, and I'm like, you have no idea their journey. You only see the success. You don't <laughs> see all of the failures. And right. they have to, they have to be there. If there's success, there's failure too, right next to it. Yeah. No one's was like, no one has been like awesome from day one. I mean, we all have our, no. our struggles behind. I mean, I've had, I've had mine since Roman was born. I'm like, kind of had this identity crisis, you know, you know, when he was born, I'm like, I feel like a failure because I can't change his diaper. Then I figured that out. And, you know, little by little, I'm like, I'm back to, I'm back better than ever before. But it's like, we all have these, these things that we go through. Um, but I will say that, you know, even though we're, we're dealing with this often on socials and, and, you know, uh, we get commenters that, or you could say that they're trolls. I, I, I think of them as people that are creatively stuck and unhappy with themselves. But when, so it's just, so when you have a bad day, you wake up, you maybe didn't sleep good enough. And then you deal with these comments and how do you recenter yourself so that you're able to get back on track and, and back to the, your correct uh, uh, mindset? So I, I, the first thing I thought of when you were saying that is like, I have this rule it's a recent rule too, that the way that people present themselves to me is the same voice they're using to, toward themselves. And so once I really let that sink in for myself, I realized that when people are nasty, if you think that that is the constant voice that they have toward themselves, it really lets you have an understanding of, first of all, how little it has to do with you. And secondly, how terrible it must be to live with that constant voice. So um, I'm quick to just let it go because it doesn't really mean anything about me. Um, and a lot of people are struggling with the voice that they have, the story they're telling themselves, which literally has nothing to do with me. Um, so that's the first thing. But, but secondly, honestly... At the end of the day, I'm a photographer, right? And I love photography. And I'm all these other things as well. But I think I really just know who I am. I, I'm comfortable with myself. I understand that if everything fell apart, I'd still be okay. Because I'm always okay. Like, it's always all right. And so um, writing the, the day when it goes sideways it really is that silence. It's that stillness. It's going back to a place. Even if I can't go somewhere, it's just getting shut down. And you'll see me sometimes before a trade show. If I'm going on stage, I do that. I'll go somewhere and just like be by myself for a second to catch my breath to like, whew, because the energy there, you know how it is. Mm -hmm. Energy at a trade show is like crazy. There's so much different energy. So just finding my center for a second, like, okay. Now I want to make sure that I'm here as myself and, um, you know, you never know what profound effect you can have on a person. So yeah, that's how I do what I do. Cool. I mean, that, that's kind of what I do. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm doubly happy that to hear that. Cause I, I find that just giving myself uh, a minute or two of, of, of peace, I'm quickly realigned, I'm re-energized. And I'm good to go. I don't know. Have you ever heard the, uh, the meditation on one? Mm -mm. So I do this meditation on one and it's only just for like a minute or so. I close my eyes and I just focus on the number one. To, and for me, oh, yeah. I, it's just white on a black background. And as soon as my brain starts to veer off into other things, I just, you know, I note that, okay, I'm thinking. And then I just come back to one and I, I do that anywhere um, for just like a minute sometimes too. And that seems to always... That works for me anyways. It just gets me back on track. And I'm like, all right, I can push through. This is an this is not a, the perfect day. I didn't sleep good and exercise right. I ate 
crappy dinner last night or whatever, yeah. but, I, but I'm, you know, I'm showing up, I'm showing up. And I think that's yeah. where a lot of people, um, don't give themselves the, uh, uh, the, their own, their own compassion. They're not compassionate with themselves. Like if they were like, they're a child, how would they talk to that, their child their, as, as themselves, yeah. right. With you know, compassion, like, Oh, you know, it's okay. And you, you know, you're not, you know, it's okay to, to, to fail. And that's how you learn. And, um, I think often we forget to do that with, with ourselves, uh, and, and we also really the, the compassion with other people. Cause like you said, we don't know what they're going through. Right. I mean, I just think it takes a lot of energy um, to be nasty to someone. So when someone goes out of their way to leave like a negative comment or say something totally nasty, it, it actually takes some bit of, of self-sacrifice to do that. So usually I just think that it's like hard to be them because it's difficult to be hearing that all the time. Mm-hmm. And so I just think it's it's a... They need more grace than other people. Sure. You know? Okay. Got it. Got it. Um, wow. I, I could keep going, but I know you got, you got stuff you got to do. And I, uh, man, this is good. <laughs> so yeah, I want to have you come back on at some point um, and we can kind of go deeper. Cause I think this, this is the kind of stuff that I think resonates with people uh, tr- truly because they, they can see that, you know, we're all, we're all just dealing with similar, similar struggles. You're, you're in Ohio, I'm in Texas and, you know, wherever. Um, but, but you are coming, uh, to Texas. So can you, can you kind of tell, what, tell us about that? Cause I'm super excited. Yeah. So I'm coming to Texas and I don't have the dates right in front of me, but I, that week is kind of crazy. Um, cause I'm doing ClickCon right before I come to Texas and then flying down to Texas. But I'll be at Precision Camera on Thursday, June 8th. June? Right? No, or, August. Boy, oh boy. I'm, I'm going to put a link yeah, to it in the show notes. So it's like we don't need yeah. to know. Yeah. Who just, the, the actual yeah, dates is not yeah. that important right now. but. Okay, good. Because, yeah. And you're teaching I, I a bunch teach. of stuff. Yeah. So I'm teaching. I'm doing a, a, a talk on creativity, which I'm really excited about. Um, it's maximizing your creativity. And that class is going to be all just inspiration. I mean, like a total inspiration class. I'm super excited about that because anytime I teach anything, I get better at it. And I'm so excited to get better at creativity by teaching about it. And then the next class the next day is actually photo walk with a couple. And we'll be going through the entire posing exercise. So I'm super excited about that too. Cool. Cool. That's, that's kind of like an Olympus weekend. I want to say, is that right? It's an Olympus Experience Weekend, yes. Oh, they actually have a name for it, the Olympus Experience yeah. Weekend. And Profoto is sponsoring that too, so Profoto will be there with their lighting for us to use as well. Oh, nice. So basically, people can show up with no camera and memory card and leave with really cool content. Yep. And some wisdom. It'll be awesome. Okay, yep. awesome. Well, if you need an assistant, uh, I'm going to volunteer myself. To have okay, come. I'll, ca- I'll, I'll carry your bags. I'll lift your lights, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm sure you got all that covered, but I'm just putting it out there. I'm just putting it out there so I can get a, you know, free pass, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> see what we can do. All right. All right. Cool. Um, and then, I mean, I'm going to link to all your, your stuff cause it's, it's a lot, but where should we generally direct people to the first stop when they want to find out more about what you're doing and what you're up to? I would love for people to go to our Instagram page. Um, it's at Tracy Jean Photo. Okay. Um, and I think that's where I'm really focusing a lot of my energy right now. So I would, that would be where I would prefer. Okay, cool. I and mean, you're posting some dope stuff. I, I have it up right now. Like I love the, that looks like some sort of like Amazon Wonder Woman stuff and like the the fantasy. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, it's super super fresh. I, I really dig it. So cool. Thank you so much for for chatting. I know it was a little tricky to to work out our schedules, but I'm so happy that you're on. I'm so glad you did. I'm glad you got a nap before too. Oh, I me too. I know how that travel tired can get. That travel tired is, woo. I got a nap. I had cold brew. People may think that's beer. It's cold brew. I love cold brew. Then I have my lemon fizzy water. Then I just have water. So I'm all, mm. <laughs> cause I, I'm, I'm like Shavasana when, when I got to There you go. And awesome. I got to meet Roman and that was worth it too. Yeah, that was so fun. That was <laughs> so fun. He is uh, 
definitely uh, the next gen photographer. Tracy, thanks so much for coming on. I'm uh, I'm totally totally inspired uh, by this conversation. I think a lot of people that are listening will be as well. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, and I also feel inspired. So thanks for thanks for having me on. <laughs>